Hi, D. Hi, D. Episode two, who knew? Not me. I feel like I've literally upgraded to a whole new level of trust no one. That tends to be a common side effect. <laughs> I am actually very excited to talk about the theatrics that happen in this next episode, though. Me too. Okay, since you've never seen the show, I think it's so fun that you're picking the episodes. And this one gave me total Legally Blonde vibes. Full, full, full Elwoods. But wait, before we do that, let's talk about these cocktails from Grandpa's Little Black Book before we get into the episode. Yes, I'm already halfway through mine. Because, <laughs> listen... <laughs> Listen, we are teaching ourselves how to make a podcast in real time, y'all. So So true. Yes, I appreciate your thoughts and prayers while we navigate this difficult time. Okay, so today's drink is actually called the Pink Squirrel because Legally Blonde is obviously pink, so I figured this would be very fitting. So it's concocted with amaretto and pomegranate juice, which is a substitute for, I'm going to screw this name up, creme de noyau, noyau, noyau. (laughs) <laughs> I, I screwed it up. D- don't hate me for it. White chocolate liqueur instead of creme de cacao and heavy cream and nutmeg. It's kind of Christmassy. I love that. Cheers to grandpa. To grandpa. To cheers. grandpa. Cheers. So do you like love my sparkly cup? I love your sparkly cup. I'm also using my grandma's cup that she gave to me. Come on, grandma and grandpa. Grandma and grandpa. Maybe they're getting together in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> All right, are we ready to jump into our next episode recap? Let's do it. Hi, Hi everyone. everyone! Welcome to the Forensic Files Duo Podcast, where we recap the show that raised Danielle into the paranoid person she is today, and who has gleefully dragged me down with her. At least we're having fun while we go down, right? I mean, speak for yourself. Well, that does bring me to a few things before we get into the episode. We understand that we will be discussing a lot of sensitive topics, so although we may laugh at times... Please remember that we are laughing at ourselves and ourselves only. We are not making light of what the victims and their families have gone through and may continue to be going through. Absolutely. And in an effort to use the public's overall interest in the show Forensic Files and leverage the power of digital media, once the episode is over, we will highlight two missing person cases, a case that's currently on the BIA's Missing and Murdered Indigenous People database and another on the Black and Missing Foundation's website. I just want to say I apologize for my voice if it sounds raspy, nasally, or like I'm from Minnesota uh, because I am recovering from a intense season of sickness. So I appreciate you sticking around. All right. The next episode Drew picked is called Death Play. Midway through her freshman year, Marie learned that police were investigating her father's death. They questioned how a 38-year-old man could have died of a heart attack so young. The episode is from season six, episode five, and first aired on Forensic Files on June 18th, 2001. I was actually thinking we'd have a little bit more up-to-date technology and cinematic quality by choosing an episode from the early 2000s, but the events of this episode all take place in the 90s, so we have yet to leave big hair and gorgeous tracksuits. Oh, love those tracksuits. We love a tracksuit. The episode opens to a wide shot of a Catholic church service. And I immediately thought of having to watch church on TV when you were sick on Sunday. Did your mom ever make you do that? Definitely not. Definitely not. I mean, no, but... I was an altar server. I mean, you know what altar server is. Altar I mean, boy. You were an altar yeah, boy? I, I, I was an altar boy. And I felt like I had my performance every time mass started. <laughs> it's so ironic because we were like, let's let's start the podcast off with recapping episodes that are, you know, free and clear of topics we mm-hmm. could really go off on tangents about. But then episode two literally opens with a Catholic mass and I'm immediately triggered. <laughs> but even with the research I did outside of the episode, which I will, of course, cover at the end or with throughout it, it makes it very clear how Catholic this family is great nothing like some homegrown catholic guilt to kick us off well then we learned during an evening church service 38 year old stephen robards fell ill and without any other details we see stephen's tombstone and peter just drops it on us just drops it on us drop it for us peter he died later that night of a heart attack Peter gives us a little teaser of what's to come, and this is the main reason I picked this episode, because there is a Shakespeare tie-in that I thought was interesting since we were both very much theater nerds in high school. Did you perform in Romeo and Juliet when we did it in high school? Because I remember thinking I was so smart saying all those lines, but 
I also remember feeling like a total fraud because I didn't understand any of it. I definitely was not part of that production. Okay, I, just I didn't remember, think so. Yeah, no, I wasn't because I was wanting the role of Romeo, but I was told I would be much better as stage crew for no. production. Yes. Oh, you not remember this. like I was stage crew no. for a show. That was that no. one. Yes. <gasps> I wasn't even st- I wasn't even backstage for the show like I had to take care of wigs. I remember being told an ingenue is usually a really boring role. And I was like everyone wants the role of ingenue. You're just trying to make me feel better that I'm Lady Montague or Capulet. I can't even remember which one I was. I think I was well, Montague. Well, at least you weren't in charge of wigs. <laughs> While reading Hamlet, Steve Robard's daughter studied the lines of Claudius the King in these words, a clue to her father's death. Okay, so now we're in Dallas-Fort Worth, Texas area, and we get the history of Dallas that actually has, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, I feel like this has nothing to do with this case. Absolutely nothing. (laughs) So 38-year-old Stephen Robard is a Texas native, a postal worker, Then they say, recently divorced. So I thought I could save the article until the end, but I can't just sit here and like repeat inaccurate information. The article I found with more information is from the Texas Monthly, and it's written by Skip Hollinsworth. It's called, it's called Poisoning Daddy. My eyes could not be rolling harder right now at the title. But anyways, this article does dive a lot deeper into the family story. Stephen and Marie's mother, Beth, got a divorce in 1980. This episode is discussing events that took place in 1993. I mean, I really feel like Steve isn't even given enough justice in this episode because we meet his girlfriend, Sandra, and she actually throws a little shade at his job saying he was just a rural route postman, but liked being outdoors. Sandra... Sandra, I mean, stand by your man, girl. Come on. His 16-year-old daughter, Marie, has just moved in with him after a disagreement she had with her mother's new husband. Mm. Okay, here we go again with a misinformation. When you hear new husband, Drew, what do you think? Someone who's just clearly trying to have a rebound until she figures it out. You right. know? Okay. Yeah, exactly. So in Skip's article, it states that her mother's new husband had been in Marie's life since she was four years old. Stephen and Marie's mother, Beth, they separated, like I said, in 1980. And Beth was remarried to this new husband, by 1981. So this disagreement with her mom's new husband in 1993 is a disagreement with the man that's been her stepfather for over a decade. So long. (laughs) So long. On the stand, her stepfather, Frank, testifies that she referred to both him and her biological father, Stephen, as dad. This is already a messy episode. So Stephen was so excited to have Marie living with him. He was even trying to get a bigger apartment, which to me sounds like he was hoping that this would turn into a, a more permanent living arrangement. And then we meet a reporter, Skip. Wait, this is the same Skip from your article? It is. Skip, who is basically our main interviewee who takes us through the whole episode, is the same Skip who wrote the article I just sourced. What? Yeah, I didn't realize that until maybe like the third time watching the episode because I have the subtitles on, so sometimes (laughs) they're just covering the name. Well, Skip actually tells us all about Marie, and he's a little too happy to do so in my opinion. He says she's described as a popular straight-A student in high school, and then we actually hear a lot about her looks. And that brings me to this episode's first true crime class. Woohoo! So excited to learn more. Beauty in the eyes of the media is like a measuring tool for society. A mm. woman is either too pretty to be evil, too pretty to fall victim of a violent crime, mm-hmm. or too pretty to trust. As if being pretty just comes with some touch by God that deems you marked safe from the dangers or tragedies of this world. Well, that makes sense because how he describes her is kind of creepy. Quiet, studious elegant, the kind of girl that sort of you looked at twice and always wanted to get to know because she seemed so reserved, so poised, so intelligent. There was never a flaw about her. I mean, her face complexion was perfect. Her face complexion was perfect. So unnecessary. 
Who the fuck I is mean, wondering really. about her face complexion? My face complexion was terrible in high school. Okay, mine was actually great. Yours was great. Yours was great. But I got horrible acne in my 20s, which was like way worse. <laughs> so it really caught up with me and it caught up with me at a horrible time. <gasps> now, spoiler alert, she's the killer. So I'm not advocating that we spend airtime on the killer. But what makes this case complicated is she is also a minor. So this is gross on multiple levels. The photos they share of her make her look like she's 30. That's just being a victim of 90s fashion. So we're told that by all accounts, father and daughter actually enjoyed living together until their lives all changed on February 17th, 1993. Stephen goes to mass after dinner, returns home, and tells his girlfriend and Marie that he wasn't feeling well, and he just gets progressively worse. We're back with those lovely sepia filters to keep things mysterious, and we see the reenactment Stephen lying on the couch with a blanket up to his chin and a huge bucket by his head. I mean, I'm pretty sure that the props team was just happy to be included in this. And reenactment Sandra is caring for this man like he's got man flu. But then we see reenactment Marie and she's just sitting across the room. But that girl can only spare a teenage snarl at him in his direction. I know. I know. I mean, like suddenly things did take a turn for the worse and someone calls 911. Steven is foaming at the mouth and now he's in a coma like state. This got crazy really fast. Yeah, the paramedics arrive, but unfortunately it's too late. His poor girlfriend Sandra can't believe the autopsy findings, seeing that it was cardiac arrest. The autopsy shows that his heart was mildly enlarged, but I think after looking at that photo, I would think that was massively enlarged, but we can get to that later. We even meet medical examiner Mark, who is brave to come on TV to talk about a case he originally got wrong. It was probably 25% too heavy for a man his age and size. And somewhat uncomfortably, I signed it out as a natural death. His explanations to what lead to his reporting this is a natural death, which does kind of make sense to me. Me too. I mean, we both have heart conditions in our families. Mm -hmm. And from what I've learned from my son's own heart journey is that we're only now learning about these heart conditions earlier in life because of the you know advances in medical technology. Mm-hmm. So it's not uncommon to live with undiagnosed heart conditions. I'd probably buy this COD and never think twice about it. I'm sorry, COD? Cause of death. Cute. Okay, <laughs> acronym. Okay. Okay, moving on. After Stephen's death, Marie moves in with her grandparents, transfers high schools again, has a seemingly uneventful senior year, graduates, and uses her dad's $60,000 life insurance policy to go to the University of Texas. She majors in pre-med, and her dream was to become, get ready for this, a pathologist. Okay, um, what what's a, what is a pathologist? I was a little bit confused when they said this in the episode. So what is a pathologist? A pathologist, like what a lot of the people on this show are doing to solve the murders. Oh. They specifically study body tissue. So it's not always related to a crime, but still it's very much in line with. Girl, just know that there's going to be a show called Forensic Files <laughs> and you are going to look so guilty. It does not end well for her. Scott the reporter is back for a third time just raving about Marie. So for one year, Marie lived the kind of perfect life every parent would hope their child would live. She was an excellent student. She never got in trouble. She always turned in her homework. Uh, She dated some, but she was never in any way regarded as a wild girl. I'm sorry. Isn't Steven the victim here? What about him? Let's let Steven shine for a minute here. I mean, are we speculating? Absolutely. But if Skippy can do it, we can do it better, correct? Correct. Steven, the rural route mailman, brightens everyone's day. He brings your mail right to your door. Along with a treat for your dog. He knows your kids and your grandkids. He's the invisible glue to this community. But if he's ever out sick, that jerk Kevin leaves your mail in the rain. Now how will you ever see those Sears order numbers for those new track suits? I bet he told everyone in his rural route how happy he was to have his daughter living with him. If he was that proud of his job, imagine how proud he was of his daughter. Suck it, Skipper. Next, we see the title card for the show, and it says, Medical Detectives. Okay, okay, okay. Danielle, 
<laughs> what is medical detectives? Like, where are we? I still haven't even gotten the X-Files thing straight, and I'm, like, working on it. And now this, like, medical detectives thing really threw me off. Like, I had to call you right away and be like, I know. what is going on? <laughs> so turns out, everybody, Forensic <laughs> Files used to be called Medical Detectives, and it's only been called Forensic Files since 2014. Oh is this gosh. what the Mandela effect is? Because I have zero memory of it originally being called Medical Detectives. But, like, so, like, half of the show's fan base doesn't realize we're covering the show. Should we be the medical detective duo now? Absolutely not. That name is horrendous. But their logo is cute, though. I mean, the (laughs) eye in medical being a syringe that slices through the title. How fierce is that? You know what? Oh, my God. This is probably why my mom responded so weird when I was sharing my core memory from my childhood. I was telling her how the podcast is really serendipitous oh because God. I just remember her ironing and us watching it. And that's like truly, truly, it's my first memory of being interested in true crime. Yeah. And my mom was oh like, my God. yeah, I remember. And I swear, I even thought to myself, she definitely doesn't remember. The funny thing is, though, I did the same thing to my mom and she was like, absolutely like oh my even God. after explaining the x-files thing and i was like yeah no, it's called forensic files and then she's like i was like you know that show and she's like mm-hmm you guys are gonna do great i remember watching yep. it oh my god <laughs> now this makes sense let's each call our darlene's and ask them if they remember the show medical detectives and see if that rings any bells instead because here we are stay tuned to find out if my darlene validates a core childhood memory of mine and my darlene actually validates everything that i'm doing wrong in this podcast <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I love though? One of my friends listened to the podcast and she texts me uh-huh. and goes, I'm a Darlene, fan of the pod. And I was <laughs> like, that is so cute. Should our fans be called Darlene's? Darlene's. <laughs> the Darlene's would love that. Oh my God. I think that's actually brilliant. Yeah. So Adrian this. Sundquist, thank you for that. <laughs> oh, that is so weird how fast forensic files got so locked into everyone's minds though. Well, not yours. Considering right. their tagline is now not an X-Files podcast. Moving on, Danielle. Can we move <laughs> on, please? <laughs> yes, we can. So now we're going back in time a smidge to Marie's senior year of high school. This is the year after her father's death. So she's living with her grandparents and at the new high school. We meet Stacy who very quickly becomes Marie's best friend. Now, remember, as we go through the next few minutes of this episode, we were told Marie had an uneventful senior year. By all accounts, especially by Skip's account, Marie thrived senior year and into college. But Stacy had an entirely different experience during this time, and it was all triggered by an assignment they had to do for English class. Stacy and Marie had to read Shakespeare's Hamlet. As Stacy reads this specific verse, it triggers something in Marie. My fault is past, but oh, oh what form of prayer can serve my Forgive me my fault, murder. That cannot be. I am still possessed of those effects for which I did the murder. Apparently, Marie is now shaking, crying, and asking weird questions like, do you think people can go through life without a conscience? Is it time to do the thing? If you want. Yes, can we please do it? Okay, let's go. Nosy BFF Stacy asks, you have a secret? Marie says, yes. Nosy BFF Stacy says, you've done something. Sketchy AF Marie says, yes. And Stacy's mind immediately goes to every teenage girl's biggest fear. You're pregnant. Marie goes, no, it's worse. So, of course, the only other question one would ask is... Did you kill someone? How did we go from pregnant to murder? I mean, like, that is not a natural progression of conversation. This whole exchange (laughs) is sketchy to me. And apparently that's all it took. And Marie admits to everything. We now see a new reenactment scene of how Marie commits the crime of poisoning her father. Her story is that she stole barium acetate from her chemistry class while her teacher wasn't looking. But the show is keeping the public safe, you know, 90s style, and states that they will not be naming the poison. You can stop clutching your pearls, Karen. When they said... They're not going to name the poison. Did it turn your head a little bit? A little bit, yeah. I was like, we're already here. Yeah, it turned my head. I was like, okay, we've already figured out this is a high school student. He's She's killed her father. But like, why don't we just name it so we can all be more aware like me? I would love to know if I'm using something that could potentially kill me, you know? <laughs> Anyways. She scoops a bit into her paper towel and then throws it into her Jansport backpack. And that took me back. <laughs> wait, wait. Did you actually have one of those? 
I did. Wait, I had a teal one. Me too. Oh wait, that's right. We had we both had matching backpacks. Don't you remember that? Mine was like a crossbody, so like I was crossbodying it before it was cool. Mine was nerdy. I just remember throwing <laughs> that backpack into the locker, being so frustrated with life and being like, I want to be on a dance team, but I don't know if I should. <laughs> So a week later, she claimed she mixed this into her father's Mexican food. And I am personally disgusted with the production team presenting this wet paper (laughs) towel as Mexican food. The poison causes symptoms that mimic a heart attack. Wait, can someone foam at the mouth from a heart attack, though? I don't know. I don't know, but that's the interesting part, because in other sources, it states that paramedics tried to innovate Stephen, but his throat was already closed shut. And that is an important detail I'll get to in a minute. After Marie confesses all of this to Stacey, she swore her to secrecy. There has to be something missing here that we're not being told. Like, teenagers can't keep their mouths shut about anything. Right. So I found another article that lays out the events a little differently. And it actually makes more sense. Yes, I did. Uh, According to an article on Medium.com, the author Delani R. Bartlett states that Marie was blessed with the beauty of a movie star. All the boys in school were drawn to her and all the girls at school were jealous of her. No one even knew if her dad was alive or dead, so she was often the topic of conversation as she was the mysterious new kid. Marie was described as quiet and reserved, yet she was in your book club, drama club, on the volleyball team, getting straight A's, and was voted most humorous in her senior class. I mean, these activities are the opposite of being reserved. So Stacey said that upon hearing the soliloquy... What did the soliloquy say? So I looked it up. Do you want to give us your best Claudius performance, Drew? I guess, but like, is this me auditioning for Romeo and Juliet again? Forgive me my foul murder that cannot be, since I am still possessed of those effects for which I did the murder. My crown, my own ambition, and my queen may one be pardoned and retain the offense. If I was... The theater teacher. I would have cast you as Romeo. I kind of loved the wigs, though. Like, they were fun. <laughs> <laughs> so, back to the article. Stacy said that upon hearing the soliloquy, Marie's face went white. Her hands were trembling. Stacy, Marie asked, do you think that people can go through life without a conscience? Stacy said she responded, well, how about the kind of person who can look somebody in the eye and kill him in cold blood? I don't know about this line. It's all mm. different wherever you read it. But nonetheless, at that, Stacy said, Marie got up from the table where they were studying, backed up against the wall, and crumbled to the floor in tears. Stacy asked Marie what was wrong. Marie answered with a question. What is the worst thing that she could think of? Stacy, a typical teenager, we covered that. She immediately thought Marie was pregnant, but that wasn't it. And after a few guesses, Stacy jokingly asked, so this is the difference. She made a joke about it. Like, mm-hmm. you didn't kill someone, did you? That kind of exchange makes way more sense. Exactly. Right. So Marie broke down in sobs. My father, she said, I poisoned him. She told her that she'd stolen some barium acetate from chemistry class and slipped it into her father's refried beans the night he died. Refried fucking beans? <laughs> oh my god. Okay, now I think this is the perfect time to do a recap of what we've learned from the top, don't you think? Yeah, I think it's a great idea. Okay, so Marie has a fight with her stepfather that results in her moving in with her dad. Within that year, Stephen dies suddenly of what is thought to have been cardiac arrest. Marie moves in with her grandparents, graduates, goes to college. We jump back in time and meet Stacy, Who becomes Marie's best friend in high school during her senior year. Then, while reading a verse of Hamlet, we find out Marie has apparently confessed to Stacy that she killed her father. She claims she poisoned him with a chemical that she stole from her science class. In her Jansport backpack. <laughs> okay, are we all caught up? Yep. Okay, good. Let's keep going. Okay, so now I'm going to pull in the information from Skip's Texas Monthly article because he actually interviewed Stacy. So this is what it says. After her confession, Marie begged Stacy to tell no one. You're the only person who knows, she said. But that night, Stacy went home and immediately told her mother, Libby. Libby initially thought that Marie was just overcome with grief about her father and that she made up the story like, you know, any silly teenager would do. (laughs) But Libby worked in nursing education, so she thought to call the poison center and ask if barium acetate could kill a person by closing his throat. Remember how I said, remember that detail? That his throat closed when paramedics got there? Yeah, So... 
The person on the line said it certainly could and then naturally asked suspiciously why Libby wanted to know. As anyone would. I have had to actually call poison control twice since becoming a mom. What? Yeah. And now they actually take down your information first before they will answer your questions, like tell you if your child ingested poison or not. But I'm (laughs) thinking it's situations like this that is, is probably exactly why they do that now so they can get your information uh-huh. if it's like linked to a crime. Right. But for anyone wondering, Oliver got a hold of a pencil while I was doing some homework for my interior design classes that I never finished. And <laughs> he <laughs> bit the top of the eraser off before I could get it back from him. And of course, then he swallowed the eraser immediately. Of course. <laughs> Good news though, they are not toxic. Then the second time I had to call, I just mistakenly gave Holland the wrong dosage of gas drops. Uh, She's also like on Pepsid for reflex. Mm -hmm. So in my exhausted, freshly postpartum state, I just mixed them up. All was fine, (laughs) though. It really wasn't that big of a deal. They were like, why is this woman calling me? And I was like, (laughs) thank you so much for your time. Bye. Now, back to Libby. Even after poison control corroborates Marie's confession, she didn't call the police. She told Skip, the reporter, that after her disastrous marriage, I, I cannot believe this next part, (laughs) that she felt an added responsibility as a single parent to prepare her daughter Stacy for the rigors of the real world. She's quoted saying, I wanted Stacy to know that I trusted her to make her own decision about Marie. Libby said, I guess I knew that this was the moment in which Stacy was going to have to be a grown up. Literally everyone involved in this case needs so much therapy and I am so in support of therapy. Everyone in this case needs it. (laughs) While Libby is writing her book and How to Emotionally Abandon Your Child in One Easy Step, Stacy has what could be described as truly a mental breakdown. Mm-hmm. The poor girl. Mm-hmm. Like I said earlier about teenagers not being able to keep secrets, Stacy didn't. And that's what I this episode either, gets though. wrong. No, I couldn't either. I mean, <laughs> love you, Drew, but if you told me you killed someone, probably like totally wouldn't believe you like right away. <laughs> I know. Stacy immediately went to the adults in her life that are supposed to help children in these moments. They failed her, and I really feel like she's another victim in this story. I totally agree. Yeah, my heart just breaks for her. She did everything a parent would wish a child would do in this very scary situation like this. Mm -hmm. She even spoke several times about Marie with a high school counselor, never mentioning Marie by name, but referring to her as a friend of a friend, which, come on. (laughs) Like, seriously, that's like... We do that as like a joke nowadays, but she also confided in her friends. But they all said, Stacey, quit lying. You need a reality check, girl. (laughs) Which like I could see people probably saying that to you maybe, but. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Stacey starts then having horrible nightmares, which is a symptom of PTSD. And we see reenactments of these in the episode. (sighs) Now we're just back with those glowing effects again. (laughs) I mean, everyone looks like a ghost. They do. One night of these nightmares, and I'd be at the police station spilling literally all the tea. All of it. All of it. So poor Stacy's grades suffer. She starts acting out, drinking, partying. The girl was traumatized, and this all sounds like a trauma response to me. Mm Mm-hmm. But you know what? Hey, Mama Libby, your <laughs> your girl's all grown up now, huh? Who hears their child tell them that their best friend confessed to murder, and you as a parent consciously thinking, hmm, this looks like a great opportunity to learn some life lessons. Exactly. This isn't an episode of, like, fucking VeggieTales. Like, <laughs> come on. I didn't even mention the worst part about Stacy's mom. The Texas Monthly article says, Stacy's nightmares consisted of Marie chasing her through the forest. She said... I could hear Marie breathing real slowly, just like it was a horror movie. And then I'd come to school the next day, and there she was, this very nice person. We'd sit and talk in this little office in the back of the yearbook class, and I would tell myself that Marie had only made a teenage mistake. I kept saying, Marie, I really think you need counseling. At her (laughs) mother's suggestion, Stacy lied to Marie, telling her she had confessed to a priest about Marie's secret. Maybe I overreacted, Libby said later. <laughs> but I thought if Marie wanted to harm Stacy, she wouldn't do it because she believed <laughs> Stacy had told a priest. This mother is not okay, like not at all. Now, after hearing all of that, I think that we should probably play how Forensic Files told us these details regarding Stacy after hearing the confession. She begins to lose her ability to focus. She can't concentrate in school. Her grades go down. 
She begins to drink too much at high school parties. At one point, she asks her mother if she can check into a psychiatric hospital for adolescents. And no one can figure out what had happened to Stacy. It seemed like the classic meltdown. They really dropped the ball on this one, didn't they? Right? Either Skip got his facts confused during the interview or the editors just really screwed up because I was wondering why this episode was missing on the streaming platforms and it was only mm-hmm. on YouTube. Mm-hmm. And my first thought was maybe it was because the murderer was a minor at the time of the crime. But oh. yeah, now I'm thinking that they found out maybe how much they got wrong and they just quietly tried to hide it away. Eight months after Marie's confession to Stacy, Stacy finally tells the police everything. So during these eight months, Marie is just living a normal life unaffected. The only other information I found about Marie's demeanor at this time is that she avoided any topic of conversation about her father and she never visited his grave. But other than that, her family members were like, she was totally normal. Like, we had no idea. We suspected nothing. The girl was voted most humorous in her senior class at a school that she'd only been going to for one year. So she obviously had a skill to compartmentalize. Now that the police hear the accusations that Stacy is making against Marie, they start to investigate. It's about goddamn time. I mean, mm-hmm. we haven't even gotten to the forensic stuff yet. Well, here we are. They visit the classroom that Marie says she got the poison from. They check the safety manual and they find that the barium acetate page was actually torn out. It also tells you what precautions you need to take when using the substance. It also tells you what to do in case it's swallowed or your eyes come in contact with it. So now they finally answer the question as to why this poison didn't show up in the autopsy, and the answer is clearly simple. Oh, the medical examiner's office just didn't have the equipment to test for it because the machine that runs this test is $150,000 in 90s money. But, like, aren't we in Fort Worth, Texas? They literally kicked off the episode telling us how big of a city center this area is, yet yeah. you don't have the access to this kind of testing. I don't know. To me, it just kind of seems a little bit lazy. Do you want to tell the people what the machine is called? (laughs) You know, I just really think Peter does a way better job (laughs) at this. So let's just like play the audio. The technology which can find rare chemicals in human tissue is called a mass spectrometer gas chromatograph. It looks like a giant cricket. It can test for poison. It can make your party invites. A machine that does it all. Police suspect that because Marie was studying to become a pathologist, she knew what poison wouldn't be detected in the autopsy. That's actually really smart, like evil smart. Not good smart, like like actually it's kind of scary smart. It really is. So it's 18 months after Stephen's death and they were planning on destroying his tissue samples within days of these new developments. It was just sheer luck that they still have his tissue samples to test. What would they have done if it was destroyed though? Like that's my question. Exhume his body maybe? I'm not sure. What the fuck does Exhume mean? <laughs> you pull it, the grave up from the ground. Oh. But if okay. he's cremated, okay. then shit out of luck. Gone, yeah. gone. Dust Ooh. to the wind. Dust to the wind. That was poetic. <laughs> oh, just call me Shakespeare. <laughs> well, apparently Pennsylvania has gas chromatograph money, so they send Stephen's tissues to a private lab there. The poison they're looking for that the show won't name is barium acetate. Now, don't you listeners get any wild ideas just because we named the poison? Otherwise, the mass spectrometer gas is coming for you. (laughs) Thank you. I think I killed it. Peter now tells us how this machine works, so I'm just going to throw it to Peter. The gas chromatograph mass spectrometer directs a beam of electrons on the sample, breaking its component molecules apart for analysis. The results are charted on a graph. Each peak is a separate compound. The size of the peak is proportional to the amount present. The number is the exact time in minutes it took for the compound to travel through the column from the moment of its injection to detection. In Steve Robard's sample, scientists found a metallic compound with a retention time identical to the poison his daughter Marie admitted stealing from the chemistry lab. And the amount found in Steve Robard's body was massive, 28 times the lethal dose. Did you get all that? Not really, but what (laughs) I did understand was 28 times the lethal dose. 28 times. 
I'm not sure how she fit all that in her Jansport backpack. Don't you think that they could use a different marketing slogan like, so many compartments, you can hide 28 times a lethal dose of poison in it. I would definitely buy a backpack if I heard that. I know, but seriously, how long was that teacher turned around for? I'm assuming it's probably so dangerous that it only takes a few maybe tablespoons of it to reach that level. But like in my mind, I'm just picturing her just pouring white powder into Mm -hmm. this Jansport backpack and that like, don't be suspicious audio is like playing (laughs) while she's pouring it there's a big puff of smoke around her and she's like waving it away trying to act super casual like (laughs) (laughs) the police go to the university of texas in austin to arrest marie for the murder of her father she does keep her composure gives no response or reaction and leaves with the detectives that is until she gets into the interrogation room the detective barely even says a word and marie's like okay I'll talk. She doesn't try to hide the fact that she killed her father, and she says she did Mm -hmm. it because she wanted to live with her mom. Peter then gets real theatrical about this next part and says... Like something out of a Shakespearean tragedy. It was all in vain. Okay, so much of that (laughs) is actually not correct. First, Marie's stepfather was, of course, not new in any sense. Her mother was moving to Florida, and that part is true. But she planned on taking Marie with her. What the hell? Yeah, she is quoted saying if she only had told Marie a week sooner, none of this would have happened. Oh my god. It was all done in vain, but there is a lot to unpack here. According to Skip's article, Marie and her mother Beth were extremely close. There's speculation that this always created a bit of a divide between her mother and her stepfather Frank. Frank had a rule that if his kids ever moved out to live with their other parent, they were never allowed to come back to Beth and Frank's home. This was to avoid the kids playing their parents against each other. I can't even begin to unpack how wrong that is. Now, this disagreement that Forensic Files briefly throws out there as the catalyst to why Marie moves in with her father was actually a huge deal. Marie caught her stepfather at home with another woman. Oh. And when her mother then chose to stay with Frank, Marie couldn't stand it and she needed to leave the house. Understandably. Let the girl get some fucking (laughs) space. Yeah. Clearly. None of this is in the episode. This is all research I found outside of the Forensic Files episode. The episode claims that by all accounts, both father and daughter enjoyed living together. Marie was utterly miserable. She hates the smell of the apartment and she said it was always dirty. I'm going to do a warning here for anyone that struggles with suicide ideation. There's a a trigger warning here if you want to skip ahead. Marie even threatened to take her life, but her mother and stepfather still wouldn't bend. So ultimately, Marie thought the only way back to her mom was eliminating her father. She felt utterly abandoned by her mom and essentially wanted to force her back into her life. Which is so sad. It is really sad. Not the way to go about it, but very sad. So at the funeral, Beth tells Marie that she left Frank and she's made plans for her and Marie to move to Florida together. From what's described in the article, it sounds like Marie has a panic attack at this moment, realizing she never had to murder her father. But ultimately, it doesn't work out because Frank shows up in Florida Beth takes him back. And get this, Marie catches the man cheating again. Oh my God, no way. Yeah, and that's when she ends up moving in with her grandparents. That is a lot of stuff. Oh my God, that's a lot of information that wasn't said. Exactly. There's so much in this episode not said. It blows my mind. I feel like when I was doing all this research and stuff, I'm like, oh my gosh. Like, I have to rewrite Forensic Files script too. (laughs) Now, look, I can empathize with Marie and hate all the adults in this story besides Mm -hmm. Steven and his girlfriend, Sandra. But that does not excuse what Marie did. A lot of kids are in horribly abusive and toxic environments, and they never murder their parents, right? Mm -hmm. Why murder the one parent who is there for you with open arms? Yeah, I know. That's just cruel. I found no source that he was a bad man. What I did find is that Beth is quoted saying she became disillusioned with Stephen, basically because he struggled with his mental health. That's so terrible. He struggled with depression and had manic episodes and periods of not being able to get out of bed. This poor guy, my heart breaks for him so much. I'm not saying it's easy to be married with someone struggling with mental health. As the one in my own marriage that struggles with depression and anxiety, I am so grateful to have a loving and supportive partner because Beth, Honey, you ain't it. Okay, wait. Because what Skip says in this next section just pissed me off now knowing everything you just told me. And thus began this tale 
that in many ways is a kind of twisted modern parable of teenage girls in the suburbs. These girls that are have those mercurial emotions, but also many of whom are girls of divorce, who are trying to grow up with parents who have split up and seem often preoccupied with rebuilding their own lives and forget about the needs of their own children. How is this the same person who wrote the article that I'm sourcing? I'm just so confused. Mm-hmm. Marie surprises everyone by pleading not guilty. She starts singing a new tune saying she didn't plan on killing her father, but just wanted to make him really sick. In 1996, she goes on trial for the murder of her father, and within an hour of deliberations, the jurors find her guilty. Her own intelligence ruined her defense. Considering she was a straight-A chemistry student wanting to be a pathologist, she can't play dumb now. And there's the legally blonde moment of it all. Chenny, why is it that Tracy Marcinko's curls were ruined when she got hosed down? Because they got wet. Exactly. Because isn't it the first cardinal rule of perm maintenance that you're forbidden to wet your hair for at least 24 hours after getting a perm at the risk of deactivating the ammonium thyglocalate? Yes. And wouldn't somebody who's had, say, 30 perms before in their life be well aware of this rule? And if, in fact, you weren't washing your hair, as I suspect you weren't because your curls are still intact, wouldn't you have heard the gunshot? And if, in fact, you had heard the gunshot, Brooke Wyndham wouldn't have had time to hide the gun before you got downstairs, which would mean that you would have had to have found Mrs. Wyndham with a gun in her hand to make your story plausible. Isn't that right? She's my age. Did she tell you that? How would you feel if your father married someone who was your age? You, however, had time to hide the gun, didn't you, Chutney? After you shot your father. I didn't mean to shoot him. I thought it was you walking through the door. See, we do know science. (laughs) The forensic evidence, the confession, and the testimony of her own best friend all worked against her. The things Skip then says are just so off base. So we'll add some color to it. Some people say she's society's worst nightmare. A girl who kills her dad. Others say she's a symbol of what modern divorce has done to us. Medical examiner Mark says Marie was just a very clever killer. Thank you for straight facts, Emmy Mark. I'll just tell you she was good enough to fake me out initially. I'm really ready to close the book on this case. Then I will wrap it up quickly. Marie was sentenced to 27 years in prison, and we get a very late arrival of Marie's attorney, who just nonchalantly says, I don't know what we do about it, but they are kids. They don't think exactly like adults. There's another minute or two talking about Marie being a model prisoner, and truthfully, I don't care. Then Skip really hijacks the victim role from Stephen, and I just don't want to give it any more attention. Now I hope Stephen is resting in peace and that the family and friends who loved him have found comfort after all these years. Me too, and I really hope Stacy has processed her trauma and been able to put mm-hmm. this all behind her as well. Team Stacy, all the way. All the way. Do you have any updates, Drew? Because I think I went through all of mine during the episode. You love some research. I did mine. She was actually released on parole in 2003. And what? get this, she is believed to now be living under a new private identity. Please, Marie, don't send us anything in an envelope that you stole in a Jansport backpack. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you so much. It was, by all accounts, the perfect crime. Now for our missing persons cases that we would like everyone to know about. DeAndrea Ford was last seen on September 22nd between 1 a.m. to 1.20 a.m. walking out of the Divas Cabaret on 11927 East Freeway, Houston, Texas. She was with a male customer who she was speaking with moments prior. DeAndrea entered a white GMC Savannah three-door van with the unknown male. It was reported that DeAndrea and the male remained in the vehicle for over an hour. At approximately 2.30 a.m., the van drove away without headlights or taillights, and no passengers existing. DeAndrea made a call to a female friend around 2 a.m., and that call was missed. She hasn't been seen or heard of since. She is 5'4", 170 pounds, long brown hair, brown eyes, race listed as black with medium complexion. She has a floral tattoo sleeve on the right arm and an upper forward-facing tattoo on her right shoulder, a large rose tattoo on her right thigh, 
a Roman numeral tattoo on her forearm, and a hand tattoo near her thumb along with another tattoo. Now, I've watched videos of the family just pleading with the public and the police to make this a priority, and they are being shut out. Court papers obtained by USA Today also show that Ford is listed as a victim and a witness in a capital murder case stemming from a killing this past spring. So please, please what? spread the news about the search for DeAndrea Ford. There was a person of interest that was detained, but has since been released. So you can submit information to the Black and Missing Foundation's tip line at blackandmissinginc.com slash tip line. And from the Bureau of Indian Affairs.gov website is the case of Robert Garrett Stewart Jr. Law enforcement authorities are seeking information in his disappearance from Montana. He has black hair, brown eyes, six feet tall, ranging from 130 to 150 pounds. According to Uncover.com, Robert Garrett Stewart Jr. is a member of the Crow Indian tribe and lives in Billings, Montana, on the reservation. Robert was last seen on October 4, 2013 with friends near Jackson Street and State Avenue in Billings. That day, the weather was snowy and rainy. While there is limited information on the circumstances of Robert's disappearance, there is now some speculation that Robert may have been disoriented that day. Robert was reported missing by his father, Robert Garrett Stewart Sr., on October 10, 2013. Robert was last seen wearing a Western Sugar baseball cap that was brown in front with white mesh on the back, as well as a gray zip-up sweatshirt with a grease stain on the front pocket area with faded blue Wrangler jeans. He had recently shaved his head and had been growing a mustache and goatee. He wears glasses, but at the time of his disappearance, he was not wearing them. He also goes by his middle name, Garrett, and his family called him Baby Garrett. Robert is named after his father and is still demanding justice for his son. Five years later, Robert's cousin, Hub Williamson, vanished on April 6, 2019. But police do not believe these cases are related. To submit case information or tips, you can do so one of three ways. Text in all capital letters B-I-A-M-M-U and your tip to 847-411. Call in tips to 1-833-560-2065 or email all in caps O-J-S underscore M-M-U at B-I-A dot gov. We will also post the case information on our Instagram at Forensic Files Podcast and our Facebook, the Forensic Files Duo Discussion Group. But first, please go and follow at Black and Missing FDN and at MMI Who Is Missing. Woo! I mean, that was a lot of information. I feel like I learned that, a lot. And then us also learning how to record remotely. <laughs> We're I'm about to it break out. down. Don't break down. Everything is fine. Everything is fine. But that second episode really took me. It for was a very loop. Uh, legally blonde though, with like the daughter killing her, her dad. dad and the uh, thymotoline glockling. I don't even know. Remember what? Oh yeah, about the perm. Never left my mind though, because anytime I got a perm, it was always a mistake. But I always remembered. <laughs> Can't touch water. Cardinal rule. Thank you, Elle Woods. Also, I just want to mention that I am wearing the bright color of pink for Elle Woods. And I'm wearing black, the color of death. <laughs> Thank you, Legally Blonde, for inspiring me to do this um, pick for our episode. I think it was interesting and I got very angry and very heated. Ooh, and I can't wait for the next one that I picked. I did not know about this case. I did not know about the copycat. I didn't know either. Yeah, and it was in New York. Yeah, Yeah. I know. So like, I'm very excited for the next episode. And thank you guys for bearing with us as we figure this out. I (laughs) cannot even convey the amount of learning. I wish you all could see Danielle's face right now. I'm malfunctioning. (laughs) I think I've quit the podcast before episode two about three times in my head. (laughs) Already like having monologues of how I was going to tell you I quit before we even got to episode two. (laughs) But then I was like, no, I can't give up on him. (laughs) I can't give up on this. I know. And I felt the same way. But you know what? We are killing it. We are killing it. And we are going to continue to kill it for you. (laughs) guys thank you for coming to our podcast if you could be so kind to please give us a five-star review to kind of boost us forward and help us feel encouraged (laughs) to keep on going that would be great (laughs) you can find us wherever you listen to podcasts you can also find us on instagram at forensic files podcast on facebook is forensic files duo discussion group thank you so much thank you so much until the next one bye smooches
It's one line. It's one line. <laughs> okay. Okay. okay, ready? <laughs> Hi, everyone. <laughs> Maybe you Fucking should just <laughs> No, we have to do it together. <laughs> That's a word. Innovate. Innovate. In, in, intu, in, mm. Innovate. Intubate. Intubate. In, intubate. Innovate. In, innovate. In, intubate. Can it like speak it for us? <laughs> Shit. Can it speak it? Intubate. Like, innovate. Intubate. 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 No. Intubate. Alexa, intubate. How, how do you say intubate? Intubate. Okay. It's intubate. <laughs> Alexa. Go on. No, cancel Alexa. I was kidding. Shit, I said her name again. <laughs> Stop saying Alexa. <laughs> Good. You're in my headphones. She didn't hear you. This is a fucking mess. 